In this video, we're going to look at seven reasons why the church has let down Zimbabwe. Stay tuned. Welcome to The Looking Glass. This is where we take a look at life through the lens of the Word of God. Today we're going to have a special crossover video. On my other YouTube channel, we've been going through a series called The Seven Reasons Why. And in this series, we've been looking at the different reasons why Zimbabwe is in the situation that it is today. Today we'll be looking at why the church has its part to play in why Zimbabwe is where it is today. And since planning this video out, I've seen that the church has stepped up and is starting to be involved in the lives of citizens in Zimbabwe. The Catholic bishops have given us a good start with their letter to the president, highlighting the issues that the people of Zimbabwe are facing. But this is by no means enough. We still have a long way to go, and the church has a vital part in the rebirthing of Zimbabwe. Let's get into the seven reasons why the church has let down Zimbabwe. Number one, the church has dined with the devil. Unfortunately in Zimbabwe, the church is so full of sin, and as leaders, we've allowed it to happen within the church and even condoned it. It's not only a problem for the church, but it's a problem for society as a whole. There's a whole list of pastors that have benefited from the controversial irrigation scheme in Zimbabwe. To make it even worse, they did not even pay back these loans. This is evidence enough to show the level of corruption that has infiltrated the church. If you look at it, all the church is known for these days is <laughs> Ephesians 5, 11 to 12 say, Take no part in the fruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. If we look at Daniel from the Bible, he is a good example of how the church should be. He decided not to eat of the king's choice food, not that he wasn't allowed to according to scripture, but it was a conviction that allowed him to separate himself to show that he was not involving himself in the idolatry of the king. The issue wasn't that of food, but it was rather that of separating himself from the idolatry of the Babylonians. This is what the pastors of today and the church as a whole should be doing, separating itself from things that it should and can be allowed to do, such as taking loans in an irrigation scheme, but refusing to be part of the corruption that is part of it. It would have even been better had the pastors pay back the loans that they had taken. We need to remember that the word of God says judgment will begin in the house of God. Number two, we have believed in the lie of separation of church and state. In 1791, which is about 229 years ago, the doctrine of separation of church and state came into being. Not only is that doctrine still with us today, but it has affected how we do life in 2020. Its original intention was to keep the state out of the church because the state was trying to meddle in the affairs of the church, but it was not meant to keep the church out of the state. Not only has the church been successfully removed from the state, but the church is now being removed from all other spheres of life in general. The issue arises where in modern times people believe that faith is a personal thing, but real Christianity is not just a private belief, but a conviction that works out in the way that we live our lives day to day and affects every sphere of society. Even when you look at it, the church actually drove progress and growth within society. If you look at Harvard University, which was founded in 1636, it was the first university in the United States of America. But when it first started, it was actually a training university for clergy. And over the years, it increased in the other disciplines that it was educating people in. Even before then, there's evidence that early Christians founded a learning center or university in ancient Alexandria in Egypt. At the time, Alexandria was the center of knowledge and learning in the known world. Even if we look at Zimbabwe today, a lot of people were educated in mission schools and treated in mission hospitals. This was the church reaching out and doing things in society and taking responsibility for the welfare of the people and the citizens of the nation. That is where the church should be even today in 2020. This work was done by Christians and was not left exclusively to the government. Number three, the church has hidden behind God. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, people quote, Ephesians 6 verse 12. And this has been their excuse to remain passive. Yes, this verse is a view of a spiritual reality. But once we understand that spiritual reality, it actually empowers us to move forward in the physical reality. It doesn't give us permission not to engage with the things happening around us. Unfortunately, as a church, our theology on leadership 
our theology on justice and our theology on work and how we work out our salvation is wrong. The God of the Bible works and partners with people to achieve his purposes, and we get the benefit of being part of the greatest story ever told. Imagine if David at the time just sat down and prayed in tongues when Goliath came against Israel. Imagine if he prayed that God would send a stone to hit him in the head and kill the enemy. Then Israel would have ended up in bondage to the Philistine. Unfortunately, in 2020, the church still thinks this way. We just want to pray and fast and let God do the work. But we know that faith without works is dead. And after we pray, we need to act and go ahead in faith and do the things that God has called us to do. Number four, the church is lukewarm. As a church these days, there's a trend to preach feel-good messages. We end up not addressing real issues. We fail to condemn sin and preach about righteousness. We become postmodern relativists and call it reaching out. In Revelation 3, verse 16 and 17 says, Because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. We become so concerned about people's ties and less concerned about the condition of our congregant souls. We are all about the latest gimmicks and have become less about true religion, which is looking after the orphan and the widow. Maybe this is why Zimbabwe is 80% Christian and yet 90% corrupt. We have bred believers who are too weak in their faith and unable to stand up for what they believe in and unable to stand up for what is right. Unfortunately, this is on us pastors. We've become motivational speakers and no longer preach about Christ and Him crucified and what that means for us today. If we were to preach that, Zimbabwe would be a different place today. There's a saying that weak words produce weak people and strong words produce strong people. Maybe it's a time that our pastors and our preachers and our bishops started preaching strong words to their congregations. Number five, we have forgotten that God loves justice. If we look at many of our pioneers of faith, we will see that many of them actually stood up for social and justice issues. Charles Spurgeon actually spoke out and wrote against slavery to the point where in America they would have parties to burn his books and sermons. Mother Teresa worked against poverty in India and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr championed the civil rights movement in the United States of America. The list of Christian champions is endless. However, today, we no longer want to take that role and that honor. The Church of Zimbabwe needs to love justice and want to see justice reign over the nation. Isaiah 1 verse 17 says, Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the cause of the widow. The context of this verse actually applies to Zimbabwe today. Like the people of God back then, they focused on religion and rituals rather than right living. Learn to good do. As the verse says, we need to learn to do good. Yes, we need to learn it because it's not easy to do good. We need to seek justice and justice for the fatherless because justice is so hard to find and the fatherless have no one to speak up for them. So the church needs to pioneer in seeking justice over the nation of Zimbabwe. We need to correct oppression. I love that word correct because correct is an active word. The Church of Zimbabwe needs to actively fix the issues of oppression that are found in Zimbabwe today. We are the answer to prayer and we need to go out there and fix the oppression around us. The church needs to plead the cause of the widow. As a church, we really need to repent and to ask God to break our hearts for the things that break his heart. Number six, we are afraid, so very afraid. We're afraid to lose our status. We're afraid to face the truth. We're afraid to look weak. Hence, we form our own religious ghettos or our own ideological camps and ignore what's happening in the outside world, saying that we'll leave it to prayer. Let's pray and let God. And we're afraid to speak. We're afraid to speak the truth in love to power, wanting to preserve ourselves and our status and not wanting to lose the things that we have amassed. But God calls us to be bold, to speak out in duty to the King, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. We really need to get rid of the spirit of fear in the church because God has not given us that spirit. He has given us one of power and of strength and of divine love and of self-control and of a sound mind, which I think is what the country needs right now. The church needs to be bold and speak the truth in love. Proverbs 29 verse 25 gives us a stern reminder that the fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in God is safe. Number seven, 
We have lost our first love. Revelation 2 verse 4 to 5 says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. If we really love Jesus, if we really, really, really love Jesus, we would love the things that he loves and hate the things that he hates. But how can we hate sin if we don't love Jesus? It's impossible. We need to fall back in love with Jesus and not the pacifist Jesus who we see in posters, but the resurrected King, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the preeminent Christ. That is who we should fall in love with again. He has the power to change Zimbabwe, and he has the power to heal Zimbabwe. But as pastors, we have hidden from Jesus. Our hearts have become cold and have turned lukewarm towards him. And as a result of this, our message and our relevance has become lukewarm and good for nothing. We need to return to our first love and be like David when he sings, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And as a church, we need to repent for becoming lukewarm, salt that has lost its saltiness, that is good for nothing except for being thrown out and being trampled on. We, the church, the pastors, the believers, the ecclesia as a whole, need to turn back to God and to seek Him. Those that will worship God will worship Him in spirit and in truth. I know that this was a heavy video, but it was an important one. And I also want to acknowledge, like I said earlier, that the church has been moving in strides. 2 Chronicles 7.14, which is a favorite verse of Zimbabwe, says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. All I want to see is God heal our land. I want to see righteousness come to the nation of Zimbabwe. And I want to see the stone of sin and reproach being rolled away from our nation. I believe that God has a great future for us and a great plan for us. And if the church can get up and rise and not be divided anymore and not show disunity, then God will hear us when we pray.